Hello and very good evening to all my friends out there. Hope you're doing well. This is Asma Amjad from the backend team of MedExam Expert. Thank you so much for joining in. It's lovely having you all here. A very warm welcome to all the audience out there. Today we are having Dr. Muhammad Helmi with us for another amazing session for all of you. But first, let me give you a brief introduction about MedExam Expert. MedExam Expert is basically an international platform where you can study different courses like MRCOG and other examinations. We provide online courses to aspiring doctors across the globe. You can join us for your better future. We provide a new way of learning and building your future with us. We offer different courses like MRCOG 1, 2, 3, MRCPI 2, APCOG, FCPS 1, and FCPS 2. Now I would like to request Dr. Mohamed Helmi to continue with the webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asma. Thank you for your introduction. Hello, everyone. Hello, sir. Hope you are doing well. Please, Asma, can you allow me to share my screen? Yes, sure, Dr. Helmi. You can share your screen now. Okay, thank you. So, welcome everyone to this free webinar. I'm Dr. Mohammed Helmi. I'm a lecturer and consultant of obstetrics and gynecology. Egypt, and I'm the mentor of Part 1 MRCG course in MedExam Expert. I'm so excited and glad to have you with us today in this uh, free webinar, in which we are going to talk about placenta previa, placenta accreta, how to diagnose and manage. And this will be according to the green top guidelines. And before starting our session, uh, let me say that from time to time, we try to cover some of the green top guidelines in a very simplified way and in a summarized way for the candidates of part one MRCG. As you know, the policy of the Royal College now is to uh, introduce some clinical questions in the exam of part one. So it's not as before pure basic science, there is percentage of some clinical questions and uh, how to apply our knowledge on clinical situations. So it's uh, good to have some background about few topics and especially for those who are still fresh graduates and don't have that enough experience, they need to know some, uh, you know, little information and background about some of the important clinical topics we face every day in our clinical practice. So if you check our uh, YouTube channel, you will find a lot of webinars. You can listen to many uh, uh, guidelines which are summarized in a very simplified way. And today is uh, a new topic introduced to our series about some of these clinical topics. And of course, this will be very good for both part one and part two candidates. So why we choose this topic, placenta previa and placenta accreta? That's because the rates of placenta previa and accreta have increased very much these days and will continue to do so as a result of the rising rates of cesarean deliveries, increased maternal age, and the use of the assisted reproductive technology. So this problem has increased so much these days, especially in the countries that there are no you know, strict guidelines and strict application of the uh, uh, protocols of normal labor and intrapartum assessment and 
the high rate of cesarean deliveries, especially in the developing in the developing countries. So the rate of placenta previa and placenta accreta has increased so much in these places. And this is a very significant problem due to the high maternal and neonatal morbidity and mortality associated with the placenta previa and placenta accrete. Especially if this condition is discovered during delivery or during labor. So if the diagnosis is missed during the pregnancy or during the antenatal period and the condition is discovered during delivery, this will put the mother and the baby at a high rate of complications. Determining the placental location is one of the first aims of the routine mid-pregnancy ultrasound. We know that at mid-pregnancy, between 18 and 22 weeks gestation, we do what's called the mid-pregnancy screening or the second trimester screening ultrasound to detect the fetal abnormalities. And also it's important to accurately determine the placental location. First, the placenta previa was defined using the transabdominal scan as a placenta developing within the lower uterine segment. And of course, it's graded or classified according to the relationship between the placental age or the lower placental age and the internal os of the uterine cervix. The placenta was divided or classified into grade one or minor previa in which the lower age is inside the lower uterine segment, grade two or marginal previa as lower age reaching the internal os, grade three or what's called the partial previa when the placenta is partially covering the cervix and grade four or complete previa when the placenta completely covers the cervix. Both grade one and two are also defined as minor placenta previa. However, grade three and four are referred to as major placenta previa. That was the old classification according to the transabdominal ultrasound as shown in this figure. That's the minor previa, including the low lie, the placenta is in the lower uterine segment, the marginal, the age of the placenta is just reaching the internal os of the cervix, partial previa, partially covering the internal os, complete previa, completely covering the internal os. But after the introduction of the transvaginal ultrasound in evaluation of the placenta previa, the placenta should be reported as low lying when the placental age is less than 20 millimeters from the internal os and as normal when the placental age is 20 millimeter or more from the internal os on transabdominal or transvaginal ultrasound. So now we classify the placenta low lying if the age is less than 20 millimeter from the internal os, normal when the placental age is 20 millimeter or more from the internal os. And when it covers or reach the internal os or covers it, it's called placenta previa. And the estimated incidence of placenta previa at term is one in 200 pregnancies, one in 200. Placenta accreta, on the other hand, is a histopathological term, means abnormal adherence of the placenta in whole or in parts to the underlying uterine wall due to partial or complete absence of the decedent. So if there is a, a problem or a defect in the development of the decedent, this can lead to what's called the abnormally adherent placenta or placenta accrete. And according to the depth of the bellus tissues invasions, invasement, this placenta accreta can be sub Sequently, subdivided into accreta, where the villi adheres superficially to the myometrium without interposing the zero, 
in Creta, where they will lie penetrate deeply into the uterine myometrium, or per Creta, where the villus tissue perforates through the entire uterine wall and may invade the surrounding pelvic organs, such as the bladder. So, if we look at this figure, that's the normal placentation. This is a placenta. This is the endometrium of pregnancy or the decidua. And this is the zone between the placenta and the uterus or, or the uterine wall. That's the normal placentation. That's the utero placental interface. Here, the decidua is well developed and there is no invasion of the placenta to the uterine wall. This is placenta accreta, superficial adherence of the placenta to the uterine wall due to deficient decidua. This is placenta increta, deep invasion into the myometrial wall. This is percreta, when the placenta invades down to the uterine serosa or even invade the surrounding organs. The prevalence of the placenta accreta is very wide ranging between one in 300 to one in 2000 pregnancies. And we call these classes of placenta accreta, the placenta accreta spectrum. So when we say placenta accreta spectrum, it includes the abnormally adherent or the invasive forms of accreta placentation. So we call that placenta accreta spectrum or abnormally adherent and invasive placenta, to include the three types, placenta accreta, increta, and percreta. Am I clear so far? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So let's start now by the antenatal diagnosis and curve in the cases of placenta previa or a low-lying Let's start answering these questions. What are the risk factors for placenta previa? Should we screen the woman for placenta previa? And if so, at what gestational age? What is the rule of the transvaginal ultrasound? Where should women with low-lying placenta or placenta previa be cured for in the third trimester. The risk factors for placenta previa or a low-lying placenta include cesarean delivery, the most important risk factor. And of course, the risk rises as the number of prior cesarean sections increases. A previous systematic review and meta-analysis show that the rate or the incidence of placenta previa increases from 10 in 1,000 deliveries with one previous caesarean delivery to 28 in 1,000 with three or more caesarean deliveries. So the more the number of prior caesarean sections, the higher the incidence of placenta previa. Also, the assisted reproductive technology and the maternal smoking increase the risk of placenta previa and also the advanced maternal age. All these are risk factors for developing placenta previa or a low lying placenta. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, sir. What is the mechanism in assisted reproductive techniques for placenta previa? you are not following the same physiology of implantation you are the one who are who is doing the embryo transfer yourself okay so when you transfer the embryos sometimes they are implanted in different way of different sites than the normal you know uh, physiology okay or the normal site where uh, in physiological or normal or spontaneous pregnancies occur that's one cause the second one is that the Assisted reproductive technology also can lead to multiple pregnancy and multiple pregnancy. Okay, when you have two placenta, that can lead to 
a higher incidence of placenta previa. Clear? Okay, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. You're welcome. And also, if we uh, talk about the smoking, the advanced maternal age, all this can lead to also abnormal, you know, vascular, uh, the vascularity of the endometrium is abnormal in the cases of smoking and also in advanced maternal age, maybe this, there is some impairment of the vascularity of the uterus, so the placenta can be adherent to different sites from the normal sites leading to placenta previa or a low lying placenta. The mid-pregnancy routine fetal anomaly scan from 18 to 22 weeks of gestation should include placental localization and identifying the woman at risk of placenta previa or a low lying placenta. The term placenta previa should be used only when the placenta lies directly over the internal os. So when we see the placenta on the ultrasound lying on the internal os, now it's called placenta previa. When the age is lower than 20 millimeter from the internal os, but it is not covering it, we call it low lying placenta. When the age is more than 20 millimeters, now it's normal placentation. That's an ultrasound picture of placenta previa and low lying placenta. Here it's complete placenta previa, that's the placental tissue. The hyperechoic or the one or slightly hyperechoic here, and that's the cervix. The cervical tissues, that's the cervix, and that's the internal os. Here we can see that the placenta is completely covering the internal os. Here it's considered a low lying placenta, that's the, the placental age, and that's the internal os, and there is a distance like 16 millimeters, so that's low-lying placenta, low-lying placenta. If the placenta is thought to be low-lying or placenta previa, at this routine fetal anomaly scan, we have to make a follow-up ultrasound at 32 weeks of gestation. So that's the first important clinical point to know or to put in our mind that the first step after diagnosing of low line placenta or placenta previa at the routine mid trimester anomaly scan the first thing is to do a follow up transvaginal ultrasound at 32 weeks of gestation to diagnose persistent low line placenta and or placenta previa why we do that follow up ultrasound because in many cases, or in the majority of cases, especially if there is no history of previous caesarean section, there is what's called placental migration after the development of the lower uterine segment during the third trimester of pregnancy, leading to the resolution of the low-lying placenta in 90% of the cases before term. But this is less likely to occur in women with a previous caesarean delivery. So, the placental migration occur in the majority of cases, resolving the condition, but this is of course will be less likely to occur if there is previous caesarean delivery. And why? Because this previous scar, the placenta can be adherent to this scar and the placental migration will not occur. So among those with placenta previa diagnosed in the second trimester, the majority of cases resolve by 32 weeks of gestation. And even after 32 weeks of gestation, around 50% of the remaining placenta previa will resolve with no further changes after 36 weeks of gestation. Clinicians should be aware that TBS for the diagnosis of placenta previa or a low-lying placenta is superior to, the, to, to transabdominal and transperineal approaches and it's completely safe. And the TDS improves the accuracy of the placenta, especially if the placenta is low-lying but uh, in the posterior wall of the uterus, or if the image of the transabdominal ultrasound is unclear due to maternal obesity or presence 
of large uterine hyploids, so the transvaginal ultrasound is accurate and will localize the placenta very well. And in women with a persistent low-lying placenta or placenta previa at 32 weeks of gestation who remain asymptomatic, an additional TVS is recommended at around 36 weeks of gestation to inform discussion about mode of delivery. So those women who were diagnosed at persistent low lie or placenta previa at the 32 weeks ultrasound examination, we have to do an additional one on 36 weeks if they remain asymptomatic without bleeding or preterm labor. So we do another one at 36 weeks because even from those cases with persistent placenta previa, 50% of them can resolve at 36 weeks. So we do another one at 36 weeks to confirm the diagnosis and discuss with the woman about the mode of delivery. If the condition resolves, she can have normal vaginal delivery. If the condition persists, now she will deliver by caesarean section. Also, from the important rules of transvaginal ultrasound in the diagnosis of placenta previa or low-lying placenta is to measure the cervical length. Because those cases who have short cervical length on transvaginal ultrasound, especially before 34 weeks of gestation, they have higher incidence of preterm labor and preterm emergency delivery. And when we do serial transvaginal ultrasound cervical lens from 26 weeks, that, and we found that, or we find that the lens of the cervix decreases rapidly to 35 millimeter or less, there is an increased risk of preterm cesarean section due to massive hemorrhage. So it's another good predicting point or prediction point that we can predict emergency delivery and massive hemorrhage. So those cases with cervical lens uh, uh, less than 35 millimeters or progressive shortening of the cervical lens, we anticipate that these cases may have emergency or severe hemorrhage and they need emergency delivery or emergency cesarean section. So those cases may need admission in the hospital, especially in the third trimester, to avoid emergency uh, you know, situations. Because if the, the patient is in the hospital and the conditions are very well prepared for her to, to deliver, it's far better than having emergency bleeding in her house, then transferring to the hospital. And so this is time consuming. This may put the mother in a, the danger of shock and losing herself or her baby. Clear? Sir? Yeah? Uh, sir, uh, in, in this line, you specified the cervical length decreases rapidly to 3.5 centimeters or less. But uh, uh, usually the short cervix is less than 2.5 centimeters. No, sir? And the cervical, cervical length is usually around 3 to 4 centimeters. So most of the women, I, if they're doing a scan, I think they will have the, the, this cervical length, if I'm right, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You are talking about the absolute cervical length for that, you know, indication for circulage or preterm delivery or so. No, here, the, this is a study where, which was done before that. When we do serial measurements, you know, from 26 weeks and found that there is a rapid decrease, decrease, okay? Okay, there is decrease from this gestational age. For example, the cervix was four centimeters, then becomes uh, uh, 3.8, then 3.5, and this decreases, rapid decrease. You will anticipate, you can predict that this case may, may, may have, okay, massive hemorrhage or emergency preterm delivery. So you have to, be, uh, to anticipate that to explain the woman that she is in a risk of having emergency delivery, and you can even admit her in the hospital, you know, in the third trimester to avoid, you know, being uh, uh, situated in that condition, okay? Oh, okay, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Women with recurrent bleeding who have placenta previa or low-lying placenta, the 
prenatal care, of course, should be tailored according to the individual uh, situation. So hospitalization can be considered, especially that if she is living away from a hospital and the availability of transportation is uh, not that good. So you can consider hospitalizing her if she has many leading episodes, if she has abnormal hematology laboratory results. Okay, all this can be indications for hospitalization. So this antenatal care should be tailored. And where hospital admission has been decided, an assessment of risk factors for venous thromboembolism and pregnancy should be performed. This will need to balance the risk of developing a venous thromboembolism against the risk leading from placenta previa or low lying placenta. So when any patient is admitted to the hospital, of course, she should follow or she should be, uh, you know, uh, subjected to the risk assessment for being a thromboembolism in pregnancy. That's according to the guidelines of thromboembolism and pregnancy prophylaxis and management. And you have to balance the risk. So if she is at higher risk of developing venous thromboembolism, then pleading, so you can consider giving her anticoagulant, a prophylactic dose of the anticoagulant. But if she is at risk of pleading, she has many episodes of pleading. She is in She's experiencing recurrent episodes of bleeding. She has abnormal bleeding profile. So at this, you, you may avoid giving her anticoagulant because this may put her at a risk of severe bleeding. So this risk assessment will be individualized according to the patient. And it should be made clear to any woman being treated at home in the third trimester that she should attend the hospital immediately if she experiences any bleeding, including even spotting contractions or pain, even like it was vague suprapubic period like aches. So she should consider any symptom very carefully and very seriously, and she should contact her healthcare provider immediately or go to the hospital immediately. What about the asymptomatic woman? The asymptomatic woman in the third trimester should also be counseled about the risk of preterm delivery and obstetric hemorrhage. And also their care should be tailored to their individual needs. If the woman with asymptomatic placenta previa, no bleeding or contractions, they can be cured at outpatients with similar outcomes compared to hospitalization and at lower cost. But if she will be managed at outpatient. She should be counseled that she is also at a risk of preterm delivery and obstetric hemorrhage. And there are also some factors we should consider very seriously, like prior cesarean section, the distance between the placental age and the internal os, the thickness of placental age. So if she has previous cesarean section, if the distance between the placental age and the internal os is very low, or she has very thick placental age, this may put her in a risk of bleeding. So the parameters can be tailored according to the individual woman's needs. So here you are, you are going to assess the risk of bleeding, you assess the risk of preterm delivery. If she's asymptomatic, she can be managed at outpatient, but if she has risk factors of bleeding or preterm delivery, you may consider to admit her in the third trimester. So we can say that the matter of hospital admission or managing as an outpatient is tailored according to each case, is tailored according to each case. And we don't have strict recommendation that this case should be admitted or not. Also, if she will be managed at home, she should have safety precautions in place, including having someone available to help her as necessary and ready access to the hospital. The remaining questions will be, is there a place of cervical circulage? In what circumstances and at what gestation should women be offered antenatal corticosteroids? What is the rule of tocolysis in cases of placenta previa? And what gestation should delivery occur? And 
if is there any situation that vaginal delivery can be appropriate for women with a low lying placenta? These are the remaining questions for that part of the antenatal care and diagnosis of placenta previa and low lying placenta. The use of cervical circulation to reduce bleeding and prolonged pregnancy is not supported by any evidence to recommend its use. So no rule of cervical circulation in cases of low lie placenta or placenta previa to prolong pregnancy or reduce bleeding. That's another important point to know. When to give the antenatal corticosteroids for the lung maturity of the fetus, it's recommended between 34 and 35 plus six weeks of gestation. And even we can give it prior to 34 weeks of gestation in those women at higher risk of preterm birth. So the general rule is to give the antenatal steroids between 34 and 35 plus six weeks. But if the, if the woman is at higher risk of preterm birth or emergency bleeding, we can give the dose prior to 34 weeks. Of course, the antenatal corticosteroids are associated with reduction in the most serious adverse outcomes related to prematurity, including the perinatal death, respiratory distress syndrome, intraventricular hemorrhage, and necrotizing enterocolitis. Hypothesis for women presenting with symptomatic placenta previa or low-lying placenta may be considered for 48 hours to facilitate administration of antenatal corticosteroids. So if a woman comes to the hospital complaining of some vaginal spotting, which is not affecting her general condition or the condition of the baby, or she has some uterine contractions, you can give to colluses for 48 hours just to allow us to give her the corticosteroids. But if delivery is indicated based on maternal or fetal concerns, the colluses should not be used in an attempt to prolong gestation. So the only rule of the colluses in cases of placenta previa or a low-lying placenta with suspected preterm labor is to give us a window for 48 hours to facilitate the administration of the antenatal corticosteroids. The timing of delivery, if there is a history of vaginal bleeding or other associated risk factors for preterm delivery, you have to consider late preterm delivery between 34 and 36 plus six weeks of gestation. But if the condition is uncomplicated placenta previa, no symptoms, no history of bleeding, no risk of preterm delivery, we can consider delivery between 36 and 37 weeks of gestation and no need to prolong pregnancy after 37 weeks gestation because the risk of bleeding or emergent bleeding can be high after the age of 37 weeks of gestation. It can be as high as 59% by 38 weeks of gestation. So 37 weeks is a good balance between or to balance the risk of prematurity and the risk of emergency bleeding. Am I clear so far? Yes. Sir, uh, yes. So this, this means that at 37 weeks, we will do an elective induction for vaginal delivery or for cesarean. No, you have to consider cesarean section, elective cesarean delivery. You will not attempt at a normal labor or in cases with placenta previa. Unless one condition I'm going to say now, the condition in which we can allow vaginal delivery, but even that's very risky, okay, in low life placenta. But if cases is completely placenta previa, no, no rule or no space here for vaginal delivery, okay? So you have to do elective cesarean section at 37 weeks of gestation. And even if the patient has history of vaginal bleeding or any other associated risk factors for preterm delivery, you have to consider elective cesarean section between 34 and 36 plus six weeks of gestation. And, in, and of course, in both cases, whether late preterm delivery or even term delivery at 37 weeks, you have to give the antenatal corticosteroid dose. 
okay 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 thank you okay that's the gray zone here the the central edge when lying between 10 and 20 millimeter from the internal os so some studies were done to see what's the success rate of vaginal delivery when the placental edge is between 10 and 20 millimeter from the internal os that's we can say that's a, that's a gray zone okay it's yes low light placenta but it's not placenta previous so some clinicians thought why uh, don't we think about the vaginal delivery and the success rate here is very variable like 56 percent to 93 percent and of course this will put the mother at a risk of uh, bleeding during delivery. So women presenting with a placental age less than 20 millimeter from the internal os in the third trimester are more likely to need delivery by caesarean section. And especially when the placental age is thicker, over 10 millimeter in thickness, and contains a sponge-like echo on the ultrasound or marginal sinus. The sponge-like echo means that there is some blood lacuny at the placenta or marginal sinus, means that there is a large sinus or blood vessel at the placental edge. So this will put the mother or the pregnant lady at risk of severe bleeding during delivery. So we should consider here delivery by caesarean section. The studies done on this matter is very, or are very small observational and retrospective studies so the recommendation here is not strong. So I think in practice, I don't think that uh, the one will take a risk of delivering a woman with low-lying placenta vaginally because this can put her in a great risk of bleeding. Doctor, can I ask you one question? Optimizing the delivery, how to optimize the conditions for labor for women with placenta previa or low-lying placenta. Placenta previa and placenta lying anteriorly and low-lying in the lower uterine segment carry a higher risk of massive obstetric hemorrhage and hysterectomy, so delivery should be arranged in a maternity unit with on-site blood transfusion surfaces and access to critical care. And the indications for blood transfusion and hysterectomy should be reviewed and any plans to decline blood or blood products should be discussed openly and documented. So we have to discuss with the uh, uh, woman the indications for blood transfusion, the possibility of proceeding to hysterectomy, and if she declines taking blood transfusion or blood products, or some people decline that, you have to document that and to discuss with her alternative uh, measures, okay? The risk of massive hemorrhage with the possibility of needing blood transfusion is 12 times more likely in caesarean section for placenta previa than in caesarean delivery for other indications. So of course, when a case, or when you, uh, when you plan delivery of a case of placenta previa and low life placenta, you have to refer her to a well a prepared unit with blood bank and access to ICU. Also, if the woman has a typical antibodies in her uh, circulation and she may have, uh, um, you know, reaction to any blood transfusion should be documented to, uh, you know, make cross matching and prepare blood uh, or compatible blood for her and also any pregnant woman with placenta previa should be uh, treated uh, of anemia in the period like any woman or any pregnant woman. You have to make sure that the pregnant lady with low-lying placenta or placenta previa has no anemia. The delivery itself what grade of obstetrician and anesthetist should attend the cesarean delivery? What anesthetic procedure is appropriate for her? What blood products should be available? What surgical approach should be used? So these are the questions we are going to answer now. 
So of course, the operating team should be highly experienced and we should call a senior obstetrician, usually a consultant, and a senior anesthetist, also usually a consultant, should be present within the delivery or theater where the surgery is occurring. And when an emergency arises, the senior obstetrician and the most senior anesthetist in the uh, hospital will be alerted immediately and attend urgently. So of course, the surgical procedure should be carried out by the most senior and experienced operators, or at least they attend in the theater to be ready to be involved in the field in any time. For anesthesia, regional anesthesia can be used, but you have to discuss or inform the woman before delivery that we may convert to general anesthesia if required, and she should be consented to this. So there is insufficient evidence to support one technique over another. So regional anesthesia, spinal anesthesia can be used, but you have to inform the woman that we may need to convert to general anesthesia, especially that if there is massive bleeding or the surgery will be prolonged. And uh, if the uh, surgeon see that uh, she need hysterectomy and the surgery uh, time will be prolonged and the anesthetist may convert her to general anesthesia. So she should be consented to this, but there is insufficient evidence to support one technique over the other. The blood products should be available and the hospital transfusion laboratory should be informed that there is a case of placenta previa or low-lying placenta in the uh, uh, delivery room or the delivery theater and the rapid infusion and fluid warming devices should be immediately available. Silsulfage is recommended for women where there is anticipated blood loss and particularly in women who would decline blood products. So in women declining blood products, we can consider cell sulfage. Cell sulfage means that we take the blood which is lost during the surgery from the uterus and we, the, this blood is taken, washed and retransfused again to the woman who declined those blood products. And there is no evidence to support the use of autologous blood transfusion for placenta previa. So what's the difference between cell cell fetch and autologous blood transfusion? Do you know? Auto autologous is we, uh, it's like we, before this, uh, plan, like any plant surgery, we take the blood and we keep it. And then we use the same blood in case if it is needed uh, post-operatively or intraoperatively. Yeah, excellent. That's, that's right. So sulfage means that we use the blood already inside the surgery. Some blood is lost from the uterus and so, and even in the drains. And we take that blood, this blood is washed and prepared and re-transfused if needed. But the autologous blood transfusion, if there is a planned surgery, we uh, take the blood from the patient, or it means that the, the patient will donate for herself, and this blood will be stored in the blood bank and, pre, uh, and be retransfused again to her if needed. That's the difference between the cell sulfage and the autologous blood transfusion. The surgical approach, yeah. Uh, but during pregnancy, we cannot uh, advise to autologous blood, no? Yeah, yeah, it's not recommended. Okay. Okay. For the surgical approach, approach for placenta previa or low lying placenta, the key word is to try to avoid incision during the placenta when you open the uterus. So it's better to do pre-operative or intraoperative ultrasound before opening the uterus or before, before doing the incision to localize the placenta accurately to open the uterus or make the uterine incision away from the placenta. Even we can consider vertical incisions in the skin and the uterus 
to avoid incisions in the placenta. But if the placenta is transected during the uterine incision, you have to clamp the umbilical cord immediately to avoid excessive fetal blood loss. If the pharmacological measures fail to control hemorrhage, we can use the intrauterine tamponade or surgical hemostatic techniques. Even we can consider interventional radiological techniques like uterine artery embolization if all these measures fail. That's the same way when managing the postpartum hemorrhage. If you read the guidelines of the postpartum hemorrhage, you will find that the first surgical step after the uh, pharmacological steps fail to put an intrauterine blood tamponade or to make a surgery and make what's called the surgical hemostatic techniques or even consider interventional radiological techniques. That's the intrauterine blood tamponade, filling a, 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 a pallon, intrauterine pallon tamponade to fill a pallon. And that's the P-Lynch or hemostatic sutures, like that. Okay, the details is not important for the exam, but just to know that the combination of the P-Lynch sutures with the intrauterine plan pallon has also been successfully used in preventing the postpartum hemorrhage and placenta previa. But early recourse to hysterectomy is recommended if the conservative medical and surgical interventions prove ineffective. So you do one step, if it fails, you go for the next, but don't be late in taking the decision of hysterectomy. So once compressive sutures or intrauterine pallon and they fail to control the bleeding, you have to recourse to hysterectomy earlier because any late decision can put the uh, uh, pregnant lady or the mother in um, the danger of an irreversible shock and course, that will be, uh, you know, with a higher rate of maternal mortality if she goes in an, a state of irreversible shock, the IC, of course, the mortality rate will be nearly 100%. Uh, sir, if patient is not bleeding too much during cesarean section, is it uh, recommended to do prophylactic intrauterine packing? Prophylactic? Yes, uh, because sometimes our seniors, they ask us to go for prophylactic intrauterine packing in the, ca in the case of placenta previa pa uh, patients. No, 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 there is no, there is no guidelines about uh, or recommendations about intrauterine uh, uh, packing. I know that the, uh, this is common in practice, but you know, maybe that's, you, we can see that this is a clinician uh, experience, okay, that packing can reduce the uh, bleeding but there is no uh, recommendations or studies about what's the, uh, about the intrauterine brain. I know that some clinicians do that, but if the bleeding is uh, not considerable, so I don't think that there, is, there will be a significant difference between the intrauterine banking or not, okay? Okay, thank you. Sir. You're welcome. So that's all about the diagnosis the antenatal care, optimizing delivery, and how to deliver the cases of placenta previa and, placent uh, and low-lying placenta. So what about the placenta accreta? Now, let's talk about the placenta accreta spectrum, the aspects of diagnosis and the outcome. So what are the risk factors for placenta accreta? How Accreta spectrum P curd for and when should delivery be planned for women with placenta accreta spectrum? Of course, the major risk factors for placenta accreta are history of accreta in a previous pregnancy, previous caesarean delivery, and other uterine surgery, even including the repeated endometrial curitage. This is one of the risk factors of placenta accreta. Of course, the risk rises as the number of prior caesarean section increases. Placenta brevia is another important risk factor for placenta accreta spectrum. So 
women presenting with placenta previa and prior caesarean section, the risk of placenta, placent the risk of ac accreta placentation will be 3%, 11%, 40, 61, and 67% for one, two, three, four, and five or more caesarean deliveries, respectively. This these percentages are very important or extremely important, especially for part two MRCOG exam. Okay, this uh, paragraph is very important, including these incidences. Okay, so the risk factors are previous delivery, cesarean deliveries, and previous uterine surgery. And of course, if there is placenta previa and previous uterine surgery or previous cesarean section, this will make much more greater risk for placenta accreta spectrum. Also, the assisted reproductive techniques and also any pathology in the uterus, like the pycornuit uterus, the adenomyosis, submucous fibroids, all these intratrine pathologies can also increase the incidence of abnormal placentation or adherent placenta and placenta accreta spectrum. More recently, there has been an increase in reports describing implantation into deficient caesarean section scars and mounting evidence that a caesarean scar pregnancy diagnosed in early pregnancy can evolve into an abnormally adherent or invasive placenta in the second half of pregnancy. You know, due to the advancement of the ultrasound techniques, now many cases are diagnosed in the first trimester as having what's called caesarean scar pregnancy. And there is evidence now that this cesarean scar pregnancy, if not managed in the first trimester, it will evolve into an adherent or invasive placentation in the second half of pregnancy. So those women requesting elective cesarean delivery for non-medical indications should be informed of the risk of placenta accreta spectrum and its consequences for subsequent pregnancies. So those women who fear or having fear from the vaginal delivery. So you have to counsel them, to inform them about the risk of elective cesarean deliveries later on and the risk of placenta accreta spectrum specifically and its consequences. The Diagnosis of placenta accreta spectrum is very crucial in the antenatal period to reduce the maternal morbidity and mortality. You know, when you diagnose the case in, during pregnancy, it's very, very far better than being, you know, uh, being diagnosed during delivery because some surgeon, you know, open a case or delivery or making a cesarean section and they you know, get shocked that they find that the placenta is uh, adherent to the uterus. This will put the uh, woman and uh, the baby even in risk of uh, severe hemorrhage and being lost, especially that if you take a lot of time transecting during the placenta or so, this may even put the baby in uh, a great risk, of course, and of course the mother of course, will be at a greater risk of severe hemorrhage and shock. So, previous caesarean delivery and the presence of anterior low-lying placenta or placenta previa should alert the antenatal care team of the higher risk of placenta accreta spectrum. So, if you have a case during the antenatal period, you do an ultrasound, you find that the placenta is anterior low-lying or placenta previa, and she has history of previous caesarean delivery, you have to anticipate that there is high risk of placenta accreta spectrum. <clears throat> Ultrasound imaging is highly accurate when done by a skilled operator and women with a history of previous cesarean section seen to have an anterior low lying or placenta previa at the routine fetal anomaly scan should be specifically screened for placenta accreta spectrum. So ultrasound is very accurate in detecting cases of placenta. Placenta lacunae, giving the placenta a moth-eaten appearance on grayscale imaging and the increased 
vascularity of the placental bed, like shown in the figure here, or the ultrasound image here. So the larger feeder vessel entering the lacunae, that's a larger feeder vessel, are the most common ultrasound signs associated with placenta. Of course, there are many signs which can be indicators for placenta accreta spectrum, like loss of the clear zone or the hypoechoic plane in the mimetrium underneath the placenta, abnormal placenta lacunae, bladder wall interruption means that the placenta has reached the bladder wall, mimetrial thinning, placental bulge, some exophytic masses seen breaking through the uterine serosa. When you do color doubler, you find uterovascular hypervascularity, subplacental hypervascularity, bridging vessels from the placenta across the myometrium to the serosa or the bladder, placental lacunae feeder vessel, also 3D, 3D color doubler signs can be used to show intraplacental hypervascularity. All these are ultrasound signs of placenta accreta spectrum. MRI also can be used to complement ultrasound imaging to assess the depth of invasion and lateral extension of mimetrial invasion, especially if there are ultrasound signs suggesting parametrial invasion. So if the ultrasound pictures show that there is massive or extensive invasion by the placenta, we can do complementary MRI scanning to see the extents of the placenta. But of course, it's not the main diagnostic modality. The ultrasound is the main diagnostic modality. But if the ultrasound uh, picture is not uh, uh, good in defining the extensions of the placenta, we can use the MRI as a complementary method. Some MRI features include the abnormal uterine bulging, dark intraplacental bands, heterogeneous signal intensity within the placenta. We find that the signals from within the placenta are not homogeneous, they are heterogeneous, some dark signals, some bright signals disorganized vasculature of the placenta and disruption of the utero placental zone. And we also can use the dye of the MRI, the intravenous gadolinium, which is the specific dye used in MRI imaging. But the evidence on long-term fetal safety of intravenous gadolinium is limited. So it's better to do MRI without contrast. Here, uh, if we want to do with contrast, it's okay, but we don't have good evidence about its fetal safety. This is an MRI picture for placenta previa. That's the uterus, that's the baby here, that's the placenta localized. The same here. Baby, that's the placenta. And of course, Regarding the antenatal care place, the woman diagnosed with placenta accreta spectrum should be cured by a multidisciplinary team in a specialist center with expertise in diagnosing and managing invasive placentation. Of course, this center should have immediate access to blood products, adult intensive care, and neonatal intensive care unit. Placenta accreta can be associated with major prenatal complications from early in pregnancy, such as uterine rupture and bladder involvement with associated life-threatening hemorrhage. If the case is placenta in creta or per creta, this can lead to early uterine rupture and even bladder involvement. Some cases, I saw some cases in the hospital with severe hematuria, severe hematuria, which even life-threatening affecting the general condition of the patient due to the massive bladder involvement. The timing of delivery of placenta accreta should be between 35 and 36 plus six weeks gestation. And of course, don't forget to, con give, to give the antenatal corticosteroids. So that's another important information to know that the best timing 
for delivery is between 35 and 36 plus 6. That gives us the best balance between a fetal maturity and the risk of unscheduled delivery. For planning the delivery of placenta accreta, what should be included in the consent form? What healthcare professionals should be involved with the anesthetic measures, the surgical approach, when is interventional radiology indicated, and what to do in cases undiagnosed or unsuspected placenta accreta, and we discover that at delivery, how to manage these cases. The main risk associated with delivery of placenta accreta spectrum is the massive hemorrhage and its associated complications like coagulopathy, multi-system organ failure, and death. And many women with placenta accreta spectrum will need massive blood transfusion, even more than eight units of blood. And once the diagnosis of placenta accreta spectrum is made, a plan for emergency delivery should be developed in partnership with the woman, including the use of an institutional protocol for the management of maternal hemorrhage. So once you diagnose a case of placenta accreta, you have to put the plan for her delivery and you have to discuss with her all the steps of delivery, including the management of maternal hemorrhage. The consent would include the risk of placenta accreta in terms of massive obstetric hemorrhage, increase the risk of lower uterine tract damage, the need for blood transfusion, and the risk of hysterectomy. Also, she should be consented about any additional possible interventions like cell sulfage, interventional radiology. The healthcare professionals should be the most senior anesthetists, obstetricians, and gynecologists with appropriate experience in managing and uh, dealing with conditions like that. So the six elements considered to be reflective of good care are consultant obstetrician planning and directly supervising the delivery, consultant anesthetist, blood and blood products available, multidisciplinary involvement in pre-operative planning, so it should be there a multidisciplinary team discussing the plan of delivery before the cesarean section, discussion and consent, including all possible interventions and the local availability of a level two critical care bed. So these six elements should be available to reflect a good care for cases of placenta accreta. Even the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists say that the delivery should be performed by experienced obstetric team that includes an obstetric surgeon, even with other surgical specialists, such as urologists, general surgeons, and even oncologists, if necessary, because you know, those oncologists have the uh, experience to deal with extensive invasions and parametrial dissection and so, so they should be also involved in the delivery if needed in cases of massive invasion of the placenta, especially if it's involving the lateral pelvic wall or the parametrium. Okay, so that's even a recommendation of the American College of the Obstetricians and Gynecologists. The anesthesia, as mentioned in placenta previa and low-life placenta, that also there is no evidence to support one technique over the other. So regional anesthesia can be used, but you should also inform the woman that it may be necessary to convert to a general anesthesia if required and ask it to consent to this. What about the surgical approach? This choice of surgical technique will depend on the position of the placenta and the depth of invasion and the parametrial extension. So this should be well 
localized by ultrasound or MRI before delivery. And the preferable surgical approach is to, to do what's called cesarean section hysterectomy. You open the uterus away from the placenta, you deliver the baby, you leave the placenta in situ, and start hysterectomy immediately without any attempt to separate it from the uterine wall. But when the extent of the placenta is limited in depth and surface area, and the entire placental implantation area is accessible and visualized, or we can call it in the common practice, it's focal accreta, focal means that is adherent to just one part of the uterus, we can do what's called uterus-preserving surgery, uterus-preserving surgery, including partial myometrial resection, or the triple P procedure, the triple P procedure, you do preoperative placental localization, pelvic devascularization means that you can ligate the uterine artery or the internal iliac artery to decrease the blood supply to the uterus, and placental non-separation. You deliver the baby via a uterine incision above the border of the placenta, myometrial excision and reconstruction of the uterine wall. You remove the part where the placenta is adherent to the uterus and you do reconstruction of the uterus. This can reduce the rate of hysterectomy, postpartum hemorrhage, and duration of hospital stay in women with placenta accrete. But of course, these you try in preserving surgical techniques should be only attempted by surgeons working in teams with appropriate expertise to manage such cases. So these are the different managing approaches or the surgical approaches, primary hysterectomy following delivery of the fetus without attempting placental separation, delivery of the fetus avoiding the placenta with repair of the incision, leaving the placenta in situ for gradual resolution, delivery of the, the fetus without disturbing the placenta, followed by partial excision of the uterine wall and repairing the uterus, delivery of the fetus without disturbing the placenta, leaving it in situ, followed by elective secondary hysterectomy three to seven days following the primary procedures. And unfortunately, there are no well-controlled observational studies and therefore no firm recommendations can be made. But what is the common thing between these four choices? What are the common thing? So you're avoiding the placenta completely. Yes, avoid any attempt or force to separate the placenta. Because if you try to do that, the patient will have massive hemorrhage, okay? And you, you will even not be able to, you know, uh, correct the shock that arises from that severe hemorrhage. So if the placenta will separate, it will separate spontaneously without any attempt. Okay, but if, if it's adherent, never try to attempt to separate it. Okay, so that's the common thing between all these four approaches. There is limited evidence to support uterus preserving surgery in placenta per creta, and women should be informed of the high risk of prepartum and secondary complications, including the need for secondary hysterectomy. When the urinary bladder is involved by placental tissue, you have to do preoperative cystoscopy and you can place ureteric stents to you know, um, decrease the incidence of urinary tract injuries. The placement of ureteric stents in case of urinary bladder involvement will help to localize the site of the ureters and avoid injuring them during the surgery. Cases with involved bladder also, we can plan for cystotomy to prevent extensive muscularis damage and bleeding from attempts at dissection. Of course, this will need a urologist to be involved in the theater. We can think or consider about planned cystotomy to prevent extensive damage to the bladder due, due to the dissection or massive attempts of dissection of the placenta from the bladder. When leaving the placenta in situ, 
you have to counsel the patient about the risk of infection or bleeding. By the way, we have a case report in our hospital here. The, she was a, a, you know, a, a newly married woman. She has no offsprings. She was like 26 years old. She was gravida, and she was diagnosed by having placenta accreta, placenta accrete. And the placenta was inv invading the uterine wall, even up to the uterine serosa, at a, uh, as far as I remember. And the, uh, our consultant uh, in the hospital, of course, I was still, uh, that was um, many years ago, I was still a resident. And the consultant is, by the way, an FRCOG. He decided to leave the placenta inside. He opened the uterus, he delivered the baby, he closed the uterine suture, he, he didn't attempt to separate the placenta, he left the uh, uh, placenta in situ and leave the placenta until spontaneous degradation and resolution. And he followed her by antibiotics. And also they gave her methotrexate as because it was an old uh, uh, protocol that we may give uh, methotrexate to help uh, the uh, you know degradation of that placental tissue and the placenta uh, got completely uh, you know degraded by the uterus and it disappeared completely the patient got pregnant again and uh, she had normal life and she kept her uterus so that was a case report in our hospital of course that was many many years ago but of course, you have to counsel the woman about the complications like bleeding or infection. Even the infection can be severe to, uh, may, uh, to be progressed to sepsis or septic shock, peritonitis, peritonitis even uterine necrosis or fistula. So all these are complications when leaving the placenta inside. The only helpful drug to give is to give prophylactic antibiotics to reduce the risk of infective complications. But the, all the studies now, according to the different studies, methotrexate adjuvant therapy should not be used for expectant management as it's of unproven benefit and has significant adverse effects. Also, we can consider interventional radiological techniques by making intraoperative internal iliac artery ligation or post-operative uterine artery embolization and internal iliac abdominal balloon occlusion. Abdominal balloon means that they put a balloon in the lower aorta, but of course this uh, has a lot, a lot of adverse effects and can lead to uh, what's called necrosis of the femoral nerve, the lower abdominal balloon occlusion. It can lead to necrosis of the uh, some of the nerves of the lower limbs. Also, I um, I think one of my colleagues in the hospital he had um, uh, he made his his uh, MD thesis or study uh, research. It was about putting a balloon in the anterior division of the internal iliac artery. That's is done pre-operative before delivering or before cesarean delivery. They put. Uh, uh, an internal iliac artery balloon uh, guided by the uh, radiology techniques and then doing the cesarean uh, delivery. This decreases the incidence of bleeding at the cesarean delivery and the risk of hemorrhage. Of course, there, is, there are a lot of you know, studies, a lot of research is done to see the best techniques to manage cases of placenta accreta, but as mentioned, still these studies are not enough there are small studies to give firm recommendations. If the placenta accreta is discovered at the time of delivery, what to do? If the mother and the baby are stable, it's immediately apparent that placenta, and it's immediately apparent that placenta percreta is present on opening the abdomen. The cesarean section should be delayed until the appropriate staff and resources have been assembled and adequate blood products are available. This even may involve closure of the maternal abdomen and urgent transfer to a specialty unit 
your specialist unit for delivery. So if you open the skin incision, you open the peritoneal uh, layer, and then you look at the uterus, you find that there is signs of placenta percreta. The placenta is invading through the uterine serosa or so. So you can stop the procedure until the seniors come to you to help you and to have adequate blood products. If you are in a center which is not well prepared for such cases, you can close the abdominal incision if the mother and the baby are stable and you can transfer them to a specialist unit for delivery. But if you diagnose that after delivery of the baby, you deliver the baby and you see that the placenta is not separating and you uh, diagnose that the placenta is uh, to the uterine wall, don't try to attempt to remove it, leave it in situ and do emergency hysterectomy or you can do also uterine preserving surgery if this adhesion is focal. You can remove that part of the uterus in which the placenta is hadrant, do reconstruction of the uterus and close the uterine wall, but of course these need an experienced surgeon in that case. So to summarize the important points in this guideline, first, this algorithm, which is found in the guideline, we do the ultrasound at the mid trimester anomaly scan. If the edge of the placenta is less than 20 millimeter from the internal os, or covering the internal os, so it's low lying of placenta previa. And if there is previous history of cesarean section, you can suspect placenta accreta spectrum and you have to do ultrasound scan to see if there are signs of placenta accreta spectrum. If the ultrasound signs suggest placenta accreta spectrum, then you are going to refer the case to a specialist center for the multidisciplinary Managed management as explained in details before. If the placenta is posterior or anterior with no previous cesarean section, and you diagnose that it's low lie or placenta previa at the mid-trimester scan, you do another ultrasound at 32 weeks of gestation because we can suspect placental migration and resolution of the condition. At 32 weeks, if the case is asymptomatic placenta previa, you can give steroids at 34 to 36 weeks of gestation and again another scan around 36 weeks and if still previa, so you should consider caesarean delivery between 36 and 37 weeks of gestation. If the patient has recurrent bleeding, or she has risks of preterm delivery, you can give steroids before 34 weeks of gestation and plan delivery between 34 and 36 weeks of gestation. If the placenta is asymptomatic low-lying placenta, you can repeat the ultrasound at 36 weeks. If it's still low-lying, this will have an individualized decision around delivery. So if the placental age is between 10 or 20 millimeter from the internal os, that's, as I said, it's a gray zone. Some clinicians see that these cases can deliver vaginally, but if there are signs of uh, thick placental age, marginal sinus, or uh, echoes in the uh, sponge-like echoes in the placenta, this will put the mother at a great risk of bleeding, so it's better to consider caesarean section. If the placenta is 20 millimeter or more from the os, no further ultrasound examination is required because this is normal placentation. The mid-pregnancy routine fetal anomaly scan is done between 18 plus six to 21 plus six weeks of gestation to localize the placenta. Placenta previa is the placenta lying directly over the internal os. 
And if the edge of the placenta is less than 20 millimeter from the internal os, it's called low lie placenta. So the old the classification of minor and major is now not used after the introduction of transvaginal ultrasound. The TBS is superior to transabdominal and transperineal approaches. A single course of antenatal corticosteroid therapy is recommended between 34 and 35 plus 6 weeks of gestation or may be given prior to 34 weeks in women at higher risk of preterm birth. The timing of delivery, if there are history of vaginal bleedings or other risk factors for preterm delivery, we will, we will consider late preterm between 34 and 36 plus six weeks of gestation. If it's uncomplicated placenta previa, the delivery should be considered between 36 and 37 weeks of gestation. Placenta lacunae give the placenta a moth-eaten appearance on grayscale imaging and the increased vascularity of the placental pit with large feeder vessels entering the lacunae are the most common ultrasound signs associated with placenta accreta spectrum. That's the major signs of placenta accreta spectrum. In the absence of risk factors for preterm delivery, the planned delivery of cases of placenta accreta should be between 35 and 36 plus six weeks of gestation. And this provides the best balance between fetal maturity and the risk of unscheduled delivery. I wish you enjoyed the session. I wish you luck. And thank you so much for your attendance and listening. And if you have any question, I'll be glad to answer. Uh, doctor, can I ask you one question? Sure. Yeah, so um, as I understand now, the, as for the recent this thing, the classifications have changed of placenta previa. Um, we remember that we have done something which, uh, in which we used to say that there used to be type 2 anterior and type 2 posterior placenta previa as well. Uh, in which type 2 anterior we used to allow for a uh, vaginal delivery, whereas type 2 posterior was an indication for cesarean section. Type 2 posterior, indication of cesarean section, why? Uh, because at reverse. if you think about the reverse, that anterior, you will transect during the placenta. So when the placenta is anterior, this put the case at a major risk of bleeding. While posterior, the placenta will be away from you, from the uterine incision. Right, absolutely. Uh, no, I'm talking about the indications for vaginal delivery. So type 2 posterior was not an indication for vaginal delivery, whereas type 2 anterior was an indication for vaginal delivery. I'm saying the normal vaginal delivery. That uh, the, the thing is basically in posterior, uh, there will be compression of the placenta because of the fetal head. Um, I don't think that... Um... There is a, a, like a recommendation or an evidence base about that, okay? The only thing which guide us is the placental age. The distance of the placental age from the uh, internal os and the thickness of the placental age. That's the thing which guide us about whether to give a chance in that gray zone, you know, when the placenta is low lie, but still it's not reaching the internal os. Okay, but if it's absolutely placenta previa, it's completely previa, it's, it's reaching the internal os, so there is no place for vaginal delivery. Okay? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? Uh, sir, uh, la uh, you told about one of the study that uh, a patient was given methotrexate in your practice timings. So the guidelines say that there is no any uh, recommendations of method exit you use, but can we use it like if uh, there are problems and the patient is not willing for hysterectomy and her family is not complete. So can we uh, give her the shot of method exit? You know, the idea behind the methotrexate or even any type of chemotherapy that you, usually these drugs 
work on you know living cells you know but actually after delivering the baby you know this placental tissue can be considered as dead tissue now so this chemotherapeutic agent will not do any uh, uh, you know thing more on uh, these dead tissues okay that's the chemotherapy because the chemotherapy works on living cells dividing cells or so so the methotrexate will not give any difference with no uh, without with, with, with when compared with placebo or, or or when compared with no giving mesotrexate so that's what in all the practice now the, the studies have shown that there is no benefit so of course it would be useless it just will put the, the the mother at a risk of the side effects of methotrexate but the most important is to guide against the infection by giving antibiotics but oh, the body so will degrade these tissues spontaneously mm, okay. thank you of course still these cases of of leaving the placenta in situ is, is uh, like case reports, as I said, it's not a uh, common practice. Uh, uh, by the way, another case was uh, in a similar situation and uh, uh, another consultant, and that uh, was also uh, like, um, I think one year or one and a half year ago, tried the same strategy. She was at a very young age, it's the first marriage, it's first pregnancy. But unfortunately, she had a severe infection. She had secondary postpartum hemorrhage, and we were obligated to do hysterectomy. Okay, so it, it doesn't work in all cases. So, so in case okay. if you are leaving the placenta, uh, approximately how yes. many weeks? How many weeks it might take for the placenta to resolve? Is, Is there, there any question? Like that? No, sir. In case if you are leaving the placenta behind, how many weeks uh, it will take to resolve the placenta? Like, you know, how many weeks they should be monitored them or month? No, no, I don't have an, a, a, a firm idea. It's not, it's something unpredicted, you know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sir, yeah. I'd like to ask. Um, regarding the uterine incision, when we are trying to uh, avoid the placenta A yeah. during the incision, um, for example, a major, major, major PP, so it's better to do a transverse incision over the upper segment or a vertical incision to avoid the cutting through the placenta. There also, it's better to. According, this is according to you know, the local protocols and guidelines of the center you are working in. There is no rec is firm recommendations about the vertical or uh, transverse inc incisions. It's better to avoid. But uh, I will tell you the protocol in our hospital when diagnosing placenta accreta, we do... Okay, better to avoid. Yes, we, diver we do vertical skin incision and we do vertical uterine incision in the upper segment, you know, deliver the baby and leave the placenta in place. We will wait for a few minutes. If the placenta separate spontaneously, then it's not placenta accreta, it's just ultrasound signs. And we do the case as normal section. We uh, close the uterine incision. We may also do a, a uterine artery ligation or internal iliac artery ligation for more uh, hemostasis securing. And we close the uterus. If the placenta is not separating, of course, uh, the patient should be consented before the um, surgery that we proceed to hysterectomy, we will leave the placenta in situ and we proceed to hysterectomy immediately, okay? Okay. okay. So we prefer the vertical incisions in cases of uh, low, uh, in case of placenta accreta. Suspected uh, placenta accreta spectrum. Yes. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I thank you so much for uh, attending. I was so happy for having you with me today in that free webinar, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I think, uh, Asma, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much, Dr. Helmi, for this amazing session. I would like to tell them about the course. Okay, sure. Okay, so after the successful July batch, we are starting our September batch. In this course, there will be three mentors, Dr. Mohammed Helmi, Dr. Dejri, and Dr. Ramyasri. In this course, there will be live sessions 
topic test where you can test your preparations, mock exams, session recordings where you can get the session recordings on our website. There will be two study rooms, Facebook group and the Telegram group where you can directly interact with our mentor. The course fee is $450 and the duration of this course is three months. Now how to register for this course? If you want to register for this course, the first thing is you have to sign up to our website. First of all, you have to click on sign up. Then you have to create your account. After that, you have to click on the course catalog where you will find all the courses. Then you have to click on MRCOG1 regular course September 21. After clicking, then you have to click on get this course and then you have to proceed your payment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Asma, for your brief talk about the course. And thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you and good night.